Committee for the Economy on its Energy Strategy Micro Inquiry. Clerk, please read the motion. That this Assembly welcomes the special report of the Committee for the Economy on considerations for the forthcoming energy strategy, supports the development of an ambitious, target-driven energy strategy that will decarbonise the energy sector by 2050 while minimising the cost to the consumer, and recognises the strategy's potential to boost our economic, health and social well-being into the future. Thank you. And I call the Chairperson of the Committee for the Economy, Dr Kiva Archibald, to move the motion. Moved. The Business Committee has allowed one and a half hours for this debate. You will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. All other speakers will have five minutes. Please open the debate on the motion. I'm Gurma Agus Kankorlia and I, I rise to speak as Chair of the Economy Committee. The Committee has recently undertaken a micro-inquiry to seek views from stakeholders on what they wanted to see in the energy strategy currently being developed by the Department for the Economy. This is in the context of the British Government's legislative target of net zero carbon by 2050. The energy strategy will determine the future priorities and potential changes needed to achieve this and other targets. During the inquiry period earlier this year, the committee asked stakeholders a range of questions about what they would like to see as the key elements of the energy strategy, what the future holds for the renewables industry, and if there would be necessarily a difference in the price of energy for business and consumers in the future. The committee received over 180 responses from across energy organisations, consumers, individuals, businesses and academics, and I'd like to put on record my thanks to those who took the time to respond. The Committee has produced a special report summarising the themes which have emerged. The Committee has shared the inquiry report with the Economy Minister, and it is that which we are discussing today. In addition to the inquiry, the Committee has heard evidence from departmental officials on the energy strategy and has on the whole relayed its encouragement of the process for the development of the new energy strategy and will continue to regularly monitor its progress. Through the micro-inquiry, the Committee has identified a number of issues that will need to be addressed within the energy strategy. We are about to go through a massive upheaval of the whole energy system through the electrification of heat and transport systems, and it is important that stakeholders are involved in the shaping the design along with government. Firstly, that the energy strategy must have a statutory footing and binding targets that are clear, measurable, ambitious and in line with both the programme for government outcomes and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Looking in more detail at the current targets, there may be scope to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 45 per cent by 2030, based on the Committee on Climate Change recommendations, with a view to assessing feasibility of a 70 per cent reduction by 2030. The energy strategy should implement policies towards these targets while moving towards a target net zero carbon before 2050. To this end, consideration should be given to establishing an NI Climate Act along the lines of those already designed in Scotland and in Wales. The Committee is alive to the fact that the UK official Office of National Statistics sorry, Family Expenditure Survey shows that households in the North spend a higher percentage of their income on energy than in other regions. There are more than one in five households here in fuel poverty, and they cannot afford to spend more on energy bills. To tackle this, we must turn our attention to enhancing the existing energy efficiency schemes to ensure that homes and businesses are as energy efficient as possible. This will lower consumption and therefore bills in the future. In this regard, it is crucial that energy efficiency targets are identified and set, together with new building regulations that are future-proofed the energy efficiency of new developments. Above all, the most vulnerable must be protected during the energy transition. Investment is urgently needed in a number of areas. With regard to the transport infrastructure and the rise in the number of electric vehicles, there is clearly a need for investment in car charging infrastructure. This, along with a modal shift to encouraging walking, cycling and using public transport, will have a significant impact on carbon emissions. Investment is also required in the electricity grid for the successful deployment of large-scale renewables projects. This is becoming urgent as it is needed to allow renewable energy to enter the system. Careful adjustment is necessary for the planning system to succeed in allowing forms of energy production, such as wind turbines and energy storage areas. Additionally, smaller companies wishing to install renewable energy technology may need to access funding, support schemes to help cover the initial outlay and to reduce financing risks. The ability to store energy will play a significant role in bringing more renewables onto the system. 
To this end, we need a separate action plan to encourage large-scale storage, localised storage and biogas. In relation to the natural gas network and its expansion, hydrogen is increasingly seen as a green fuel of the future and could replace natural gas. We note that plans are underway for gas networks to transition to hydrogen over the coming three decades. There are sectors that will be able to make a bigger contribution to lowering carbon emissions than others, for example, agricultural practices. Main opportunities for reducing emissions from agriculture are evidenced through crop and soil management and measures to reduce livestock intensity. However, there is a role for increased energy efficiency. To achieve all of this, we need the local workforce to develop a suitable skill set to be able to take new technologies and infrastructure forward. An effective strategy should identify key areas of work for government, local government, educators, businesses and communities and should preferably be co-produced to maximise the expertise available and ownership of the changes to take place. There is so much to do. I am sure you will recognise the energy strategy has the capacity to be one of the biggest single issues that our economy can gain from right now. The energy strategy has a considerable role to play in making the North a place that is investable, particularly through having the levers to keep manufacturing facilities here and being able to expand them. The Committee's primary concern, whilst meeting the carbon net zero targets, is to make energy affordable so both businesses and consumers can thrive and enjoy higher levels of health and wellbeing. We have to get this right. Um, can I now make some remarks on behalf of Sinn Féin? Sinn Féin made submissions both to the DFE call for evidence and to the Economy Committee's micro-inquiry. Tackling the climate emergency is one of the fundamental challenges of this century. It is an issue we have discussed a number of times in this chamber. Back in January, the first motion Sinn Féin brought before the Assembly was to declare a climate emergency. Since then, a climate change bill has been submitted with cross-party support. This is a very important basis for dealing with the challenge of the climate change. However, the strategies underpinning the legislation will be key to achieving the targets. The energy strategy is one of the most important. As I mentioned previously, it cuts across departments and sectors. It is also a real opportunity to lay down a marker about the approach we want to take to the decarbonisation of our economy and society. Sinn Féin believes the energy strategy must be based on a number of principles. Foremost of those it is, is a just transition. As we seek to rapidly decarbonise away from fossil fuel dependency, there is an opportunity to tackle the economic status quo that has caused and exacerbated the climate crisis and to reshape our economy, creating a fairer, more equal and sustainable society. The COVID crisis has brought into sharp focus economic inequalities, and as we plan our recovery, it is critical that a just transition approach is core to the economic rebuilding. Secondly, public and community ownership of energy and renewable resources. Across this island, we have the resources which can be harnessed to provide the energy we need. Communities and the public should have the opportunity to directly benefit from these abundant resources. Democratising our energy market not only gives communities a financial stake, but increases the awareness and buy-in from the public towards the goals of decarbonisation. Thirdly, urban and rural equality. Tackling regional imbalances in our energy supply must be part of the energy strategy. Based on the principles of just transition, the barriers faced by rural communities, for example lack of public transport, must be taken account of. Fourthly, a Green New Deal. A Green New Deal was a commitment in New Decade New Approach and as I already mentioned, it must be one of the key facets of our economic recovery strategy. The potential of our renewable resources provide huge opportunities for the creation of green-collar jobs through investment in research and innovation, infrastructure and skills development. And finally, the climate does not recognise borders, so on this small island there needs to be strong cooperation. Our energy market is already integrated, and we must ensure that our energy strategy takes account of this. It also must harness modern technologies to insist in achieving our emissions reduction targets. An energy strategy based on these principles with ambitious targets that are regularly reviewed and sectoral plans will go a long way to achieving the progress towards decarbonisation that we need to see in the short, medium and longer term. So again, I would like to thank those who shared their views with the committee. The report is now available on the committee's web page on the Assembly website. And I would encourage anyone with an, with an interest to read that and to continue to engage with the process of the development of the new energy strategy. I commend the motion to the Assembly. Thank you. And I call Gordon Dunn.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too welcome the opportunity to speak on this important issue as a member of the Economy Committee. There is no doubt energy affordability and security of supply are key issues, and we must ensure that they are kept high on the agenda. The cost of electricity to consumers continues to be a real challenge to both domestic and commercial energy users. Energy has been an important issue within the Committee for some time. And the micro inquiry has been an opportunity for stakeholders within the sector to have their say and engage on this very important issue. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has presented unprecedented challenges for both businesses and domestic consumers. Whilst having a strategy in place to ensure we have a sustainable energy future, it is important that our short-term challenges to ensure that energy is affordable is paramount. Manufacturing is a sector with huge challenges relating to energy costs. The high energy costs for manufacturing is very challenging for them to be able to compete globally in the world marketplace. Wind energy has been the, the main source of renewable energy in Northern Ireland, something which we all seem to be proud of, being able to achieve its renewable target of 40% by 2020. This was heavily incentivised through the Renewable Obligation Scheme, commonly known as ROCS, which is now closed. But I do question the total cost of the scheme, which, pro which providers have been tied into with 20-year contracts. There are drawbacks, of course, within wind energy, as wind is not consistent, and there are many wind turbines producing surplus amounts of energy, which could be transferred to battery storage units for later use or later to be fed into the grid system. However, there are many major challenges in getting sufficient battery capacity to, to deliver this. Connections into the grid continue to be a challenge for wind turbines with weak infrastructure in some parts of the country. There is a problem with most of the generation being in the west of the province, while there is greater demand for supply in the east of the province. The gas network also needs further support. More needs to be done to encourage consumers to connect to gas. Suppliers like Phoenix continue to encourage uptake within the greater Belfast area which currently ranges from 30% to 60% where network exists, giving consumers more value and cleaner energy. Approximately 70% of our householders across Northern Ireland still have oil-based heating systems, and the price of home heating oil is relatively cheap compared to just a number of years ago, with an average price I understand today of £235 for 900 litres. It is important to have a mix of energy sources to ensure that no one is left in fuel poverty, and ensure costs are kept competitive for both domestic consumers and businesses. I recently had a discussion with Phoenix about the use of hydrogen as a replacement for natural gas, which will work, I believe, within the existing network and produce a cleaner, more efficient energy. Hydrogen energy has also been described as the main driver for decarbonising the global economy, and we do have an opportunity here to become a world leader in hydrogen production and technology. Wrightbus are currently involved in the development work on hydrogen buses, and I understand Dublin is slightly ahead of us, hard to believe, but that is true, that they are actually trying out hydrogen buses at the moment, and this does present an exciting opportunity for Northern Ireland. However, this will require significant investment, and I know the Prime Minister has committed to investing in this new technology. There is the potential to create many jobs in hydrogen technology, within the aerospace industry and advanced material sectors and supply chains. There is also a role for education within a future strategy to encourage energy efficiency through focused education. We also have the green light now for the development of the North-South -South Interconnector, which went through in September, which will help to improve network stability and security of supply for energy users in Northern Ireland. I look forward to hearing from the Minister, and I know she is committed to bringing forward a fit-for-purpose energy strategy for Northern Ireland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, so thank you, and I call Pat Cadney. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to thank the committee and the clerk for the work that has gone into producing the special report and their ongoing commitment to a new green future for Northern Ireland. I stand here thankfully that finally in 2020 we have got to the point 
that despite some political charge rumblings, I have heard both our Economy Minister and our Environment Minister speak in this chamber about the need to protect our environment and tackle climate change. In the context of this debate, I particularly welcome the Minister's recognition of the central role of the green economy in her roadmap to rebuild our economy, published in June. An effective energy strategy must have ambitious targets to tackle decarbonisation in the areas of heat, power and transport. And it must be recognised that when it comes to power, we have made some excellent progress. Fifteen years ago, we had 3% of electricity consumption from renewables. Today, it's 47%. This is a great leap forward and a success that we should build on. It is not just good news for the environment, with nine megatons of carbon saved in the last 20 years, but good for consumers as well, with 135 million saved on consumer bills since the year 2000. I welcome the Minister's commitment to building on this success by setting a new ambitious targets for Northern Ireland, and she says should not be below 70%. May I suggest? Absolutely, sorry. No, no, you're grand. I appreciate the member giving way and the member's right to note the massive progress that has been made, not only the, the contribution that Northern Ireland has made, but the contribution more generally throughout the West. Does the member agree with me, therefore, that it cannot be right that there are countries in the world still building coal-fired power stations? Yes, I have to agree with you, and I do have to ask that question. But as I say, we're looking at the, what we're doing here within our own place, Northern Ireland, and I think that it's good news and it has to be commended and welcomed as much as possible. Uh, the suggested target of renewable energy for Northern Ireland of 80% by 2030, which would have the effect of a reduction in carbon emissions of every household turning off the electricity for 1.5 years. The key success to our increase in renewable generation has been the increase in onshore wind. The Northern Ireland Renewables Obligation, the NIRO, the main support scheme for encouraging increased renewable electricity generation, spurred this on. However, the scheme closed in 2017, Mr Speaker, and any future targets must be accompanied by credible incentive schemes to spearhead movement towards our ambitious targets. However, it is not all good news. Successive executives have failed to produce a coherent plan to realise the benefits of the offshore wind, while all of our closest neighbours have shot forward in this area. There must be continued engagement with partners across government and businesses, including the Crown Estates, to address barriers and ensure that Northern Ireland has the potential to benefit from future, from future seabed leasing rounds. In terms of heat, we need to consider the clear targets set by the governments in Dublin of 500,000 greener homes and 400,000 heat pumps installed by the year 2030. This goes beyond the structured thinking of just looking at heat, power and transport. It will require us to look at changing behaviour and a model should be taken from the EU Clean Energy Package, ambition to see the citizens put at the heart of the future of energy. This behavioural shift will be key to any effective energy transformation. In terms of transport, we need to keep an eye on emerging technologies, which has already been alerted to by my colleague. While, hydra while hydrogen, which will be the key to unlocking a greener transport system, any energy strategy must have the flexibility to deal with new technologies and that we may not have fully considered today. This is not only will make the strategy more effective, but add to the longevity of it. I also welcome the work the Minister for Infrastructure has been doing to develop a green transport strategy, particularly the groundbreaking cross-border work with Minister Ryan that I hope to see much more of. Mr Speaker, a new green economy is not only central to protecting our area for the next generations, but it is now clear that it is central to the recovery, the recovery of our economy from this pandemic and will be a key driver for growth in the future. I know the committee will continue to work to make sure any energy strategy realises this potential. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Steve Egan. 
you very much indeed, Mr. Speaker. And may I thank indeed and welcome this report. And may I also thank the chair and the members of the committee for this report, which I believe is entirely timely at this particular stage in time. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I need to uh, make a declaration here. In my past, I was the chief executive of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce, and I was heavily involved in the renewable energy sector. And one of the things that always struck me then is they always said when I was talking to business across these islands about why they didn't want to invest more heavily in Northern Ireland. And they said there were four reasons that were preventing a greater output of uh, renewable energy. The first one was the monopolistic position held very clearly by ESB and Airgrid and the, the large costs that were involved in connection in Northern Ireland and the lack of investment in the grid. The second was the role of the regulator and the fact that the utility regulator itself seemed in many cases to prevent moves towards best practice and best practice with renewable energy as well. The third issue was the Department of the Economy and the question was, was the Department of the Economy actually fit for purpose and it, did it have a wide enough and big enough breadth and scope to be able to deal with the issues with renewable energy? And I think, unfortunately, from what we have picked up from the RHI inquiry and other evidence that's come to the past, that in the past the Department of Economy was not fit for purpose to be able to deal with this issue. We hope that has changed. And the final one was the issue of the lack of ambition. There was a lack of ambition within Northern Ireland to get to the point where it could, in fact, be not only a leader in, on these islands, but a global leader in renewable energy. Because thanks to geography, we do have an abundance of wind energy. We do have the ability for an abundance of offshore wind energy. We do have the ability, because we have su suitable skill, to be a gateway between the Republic of Ireland, the rest of our nation in the United Kingdom, and indeed in the wider energy fields, connecting to particularly the new developments that are going on when Norway and Denmark and the Netherlands, and indeed the very large offshore wind energy fields in the North Sea. All those things could have pointed to a point where Northern Ireland should be in a position where it could be more ambitious. And the issue I have here in ambition, Mr. Speaker, and indeed uh, to Dr. Archibald, and thank you very much indeed for this report, was the fact that we talk about 2050. Yet in our own nation, our own Prime Minister is talking about going to EV and EV vehicles being rolled out and being the only vehicles allowed on the road by 2030. That is a much more ambitious total. And that is where we should be aiming for, because for the decarbonisation of energy, we need to get to the point where we can send a signal to everybody in Northern Ireland who wants to invest in green energy that we are the place to do it. And how can we do that? May I take one example as well? One of the examples is the issue on biogas and move towards hydrogen. We have a surplus of biogas. We have heard on numerous occasions the problems we have with anaerobic digestion and waste coming from our dairy and from our, indeed, from our poultry business. We have a real opportunity here to use that biogas and strip it out and use, transform that into a hydrogen economy. We can do that. We can do that because we have the scale here to make it work in Northern Ireland and make it work effectively. But there must be a signal to the market to make it happen, and that must be part of a strategy, and it must be part of ambition to try and make that happen as well. And the issue with the grid, I think, is significant. Many of us who have had, many of our constituents have come to us and have complained when they've tried to connect low energy wind or anaerobic digestion onto the grid, discover they're being charged three or four times the rate they would be charged in the south of Scotland to do it. It's even more galling when it's the exact same contractors who would be doing it in the south of Scotland who are actually supposed to be doing it in Northern Ireland, yet they get charged three to four times the, the, the level. There are issues with planning. How can it be that after this length of time that we can't even get a planning process for fit for purpose? So I go back, Mr. Speaker, in my last 30 seconds, and I say again, and I say to the committee chairman, and I say to the minister, let's have some ambition in Northern Ireland. Let's not set ourselves a target of 2050. Let's set ourselves a target of 2035. It's ambitious, but it's doable. Let's do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Um, on behalf of Alliance, I welcome this special report and its contribution to the debate on our energy future. And I would like to thank Dr Archibald and the committee and all its staff for the work they have put in on this. It's a really informative document on the choices and issues that we faced in terms of energy policy. Mr Speaker, when it comes to energy policy, we must always pursue an evidence-based approach. And remember that this is a huge issue that affects our everyday lives. We are facing a climate crisis right now and we must act to reduce emissions, protect our natural environments and make our ways of living more sustainable for future generations. Northern Ireland has done well in the past with increasing our energy efficiency and especially our renewable electricity generation, but we must not consider this mission accomplished. We can and should be out front, as others have mentioned, leading not only in the UK and Ireland but the world, and we have the potential for this. So I would and I'll echo um, Dr Aiken's points, see the department setting an ambitious target for renewable energy generation. Ultimately, we want to see 100% of our electricity to come from renewables. I also note that Scotland is aiming for 100% by the end of this year. So this is clearly doable. Time is short, so if I may, I want to highlight some of the key points made by respondents. Respondents highlighted the need for energy issues to be interconnected and partnership across government. Departmental silos will harm our ambitions on a better future. Executive departments, especially finance, economy, DERA, communities and infrastructure, must ensure that close and functional working relationships are the norm. Many have already pointed towards a Green New Deal. The transition to a greener economy must also be clearly interconnected with the relevant skills training. We must not leave people behind as the deindustrialisation of the 1970s and the 1980s did, with massive ongoing impacts on our community today. One particular area that the report and respondents noted in the de decarbonisation of heat was the issue of fuel poverty. This has been pers a persuasive issue um, for this part of the world and must always be a key priority for policy makers. We must make sure that as we invest in the future of green energy that the costs do not fall on the vulnerable. I think so much more could be done in terms of home insulation first. And as community spokesperson for the Alliance Party, our housing stock does not perform particularly badly, but many of the poorest, lives in in many of the poorest sorry, live in poorly insulated private rental homes. Our entire housing stock will need to be looked at and serious amounts of easy to access funding provided to people to allow them to adequately heat and light their homes. Our public buildings too will need improvement and this is why both the Department of Education and Health, who own a huge portion of public buildings in Northern Ireland, need to be brought in. And let's not forget the Department of Communities rule and Department of Finance rule with the number of publicly owned homes. There are many opportunities in the decarbonisation of heat already, and I think that more needs to be done in integrating these into plans and planning and planning regulations for the future. This will require investment in our energy infrastructure and breaking down barriers that prevent necessary and eco-friendly projects from progressing. Energy storage will also be key. In particular, as the report highlights, we should be looking at our mix, whether offshore wind and other marine technologies could play a considerable part of this. Finally, there's also transport, as has been mentioned before. We are a heavily car-dependent society. And until COVID, private transport was having a renaissance. More out of necessity, but when things start to return to normal, major investments in transport will be needed. And this needs to be taken into electric vehicles and a hydrogen infrastructure for cars. But absolutely should mean public transport that runs on electricity or clean energies, certainly not petrol or diesel. We have an opportunity in Northern Ireland with the Department of Infrastructure and Northern Ireland Water to consider if there are options to develop hydrogen production, which as we know needs a steady volume of water and given that Northern Ireland Water is one of the highest users of electricity, it's in their interests to be part of this process. We may even be able to resolve the ongoing issue of the cost of running a water system and keeping it at the required standard by bringing energy production options into consideration through Northern Ireland Water. Mr Speaker, energy policy affects us all, so we have to get this right and ensure that everyone in our society is invested in this. Northern Ireland deserves clean and healthy air, a protected environment and a sustainable and secure energy supply. And I look forward to the Department's consultation on an energy strategy, taking into consideration this report in order to secure this. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Paul Frew.
uh, Speaker, uh, and I rise to welcome this uh, mega report and to thank the committee for their work in this. Energy is always going to be a massive piece in the economy portfolio. And can I also pay tribute to the Minister, who has met me on this issue also. Um, but the, the big issues that face us now, and, and, and let's face it, energy is a massive issue for any devolved assembly or any jurisdiction, simply because we all pay for it. The problem we have in Northern Ireland is that our heavy industrial users pay more for it because of the network charges and everything else that goes with that. And that has been a massive problem over the years and has led, I believe, to job losses, uh, not only in my own constituency but right across, whereby energy uh, costs were ranked in the top five of all the reasons why businesses left uh, these shores. So it's a massive issue and I thank the committee for keeping it on the boil. I must stand here today uh, and speak about my own constituency, Mr Speaker, and Rightbus and the work they have done with hydrogen. There's massive issues with energy, but it's not necessarily the carbon issue, because I think we've resolved a good bit of that with regards to renewable energy. Where carbon has to be fought is transport and heat. And by bringing in hydrogen, producing buses hydrogen buses, you're, creating, you're killing two birds with one stone. You are creating a, a growth in the transport sector where you're reducing carbon, but you're also utilising the wind, which we cannot utilise currently because we cannot put it onto the grid because of the inertia issue. You can produce as much wind as you like, but unless you have a system to back it up, unless you have the inertia uh, to keep it stable, you will not be able to use it. Now, there's many ways you can do that. You can do that by battery storage, by containing the energy produced, or you can convert it to hydrogen. You can then put that hydrogen into our bus stock and our heavy goods vehicles, I would suggest. I suspect that in local small cars, consumer cars, battery is the way to go, but hydrogen at the minute is the most definitely the way to go. And there's times in energy where you stay still and you watch and you monitor what's happening across the world. I would suggest to the committee and the minister that hydrogen is not one of those times when you stop and look. You go. You go for it whenever we have all the, all the uh, items there available, all the tools there, all the well we're fall, and right bus right in the lap of Northern Ireland in order to... Yes, I will. Yeah. The member for giving way. One of the secondary, or one of the outcomes of producing hydrogen is oxygen. And there's a world shortage on oxygen, so Northern Ireland not only could be one of the higher producers of hydrogen, but we can also resolve an oxygen problem. Does the member think that there should be, therefore, investment into hydrogen production on a whole, a massive scale? I, I would agree with that entirely. I really would. But you can have all the energy strategies and all the plans in the world. But unless you have a system operator that is fit for purpose, you will fail. And what I mean by that, the system operator, which is Sony, has massive issues with independence, with governance, and that is hurting Northern Ireland, and it will hurt Northern Ireland in the future. Now, Sony has only been to the Economy Committee once, and I must applaud my colleague Christopher Stelford, who basically tore them to pieces because of the problems within. And just to pick one example, because I know my time's short, one example is this. Sony's owner, Airgrid, I have no problems with who owns Sony. I have no problems with who owns the owners. It's the transparency issue that I have real problems for. And since Airgrid has owned Sony, there has been a, sif a sifting of £12 million out of Sony to Airgrid for cross-charging which they won't tell us what it's for, they won't tell us what it was charged on, they don't tell us what it paid for, and they hide, they hide behind their statement of accounts to Companies House. And they use, they use uh, a, a, a model, uh, FRS 101, to justify that secrecy and the lack of transparency. If we do not have a system operator that functions properly,
that's fit for purpose, that's full capacity, and has truly and properly independent, we will fail no matter what strategy we put in place, no matter what plan we have for the future. If we do not have a fit for purpose and fixed Sony, we will fail, and we will all pay, every single one of us, but mostly our businesses, our heavy industry users, and that will be catastrophic for jobs and business and the economy. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you, Nan. I call Phil McQuiggan. Graham Elgood, uh, Karen Collier, uh, and like others, I want to thank uh, my party colleague and committee chair for bringing this uh, inquiry report to the Assembly for debate. Any energy strategy must be firm, placed firmly in the context of the global climate and biodiversity crisis, and therefore, us here in the North, strategy must be, ambitious, must be an ambitious exercise in decarbonisation and radical climate action. The United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has reported that two thirds of all fossil fuels that we currently know to exist must remain in the ground if we are to avoid irreversible climate change. Therefore, it is madness that we would even allow exploration for further fuel reserves here in the North. Ireland's fossil fuels must remain in the ground. And that is the view of this Assembly, as expressed clearly and loudly in a recent debate on fracking and petroleum licensing. Uh, and this view must direct the action, strategies, and policies of the Economy Minister. The, claim, the Committee on Climate Change requires at least 35 per cent reduction by 2030 to contribute to the fifth carbon budget, uh, and we have modelled for a reduction of up to 45 per cent. This 45 per cent reduction uh, should be the lower limit uh, of our ambition. In fact, uh, given our abundance of renewable resources, it is decidedly unambitious. Uh, as others have uh, already pointed out. For example, the Scottish Government have committed to a 75 per cent reduction against the 1990 baseline by 2030 in their Climate Change Act. Uh, in fact, uh, we in the North still do not have our own Climate Act, the only jurisdiction on these islands with that dubious claim, uh, and it is again recognition that we need to catch up. A bespoke Climate Change Act must be devised and implemented as a matter of urgency to codify targets and lay out clear emission reduction milestones. It should also codify sectoral sub-targets for emission reduction. To rapidly decarbonise, we must also tackle the issue of demand. This energy strategy should lay out clear sectoral energy efficiency targets bound by an overall efficiency target. It must do so in a way that is consistent with just transition principles. Any move to decarbonise cannot disenfranchise workers or their families or make their lives more difficult. Otherwise, the policy will be resisted and fail. If planned properly, though, a just transition could, in fact, positively transform the lives of people, rapidly reducing emissions while creating high-quality and secure green-collar jobs, warmer homes for all through retrofitting and other measures. It could develop more efficient ways of moving around through investment in active travel and public transport, helping to create a healthier lifestyle. It can produce a world-class digital and physical infrastructure with an abundance of renewable and more affordable electricity from our common wind and tidal resources. The Kilroot coal fire power station, for example, must be closed by 2025 at the latest. However, in line with just transition principles, this should only be done with the necessary employment supports and retraining offering in place for workers and full cooperation with trade unions. The closure of Kilroot should not leave any worker unemployed or any family worse off. For both moral and practical reasons, we need an energy strategy based on the principles of just transition. The requirement to urgently transform our society and our economy away from fossil fuel dependency and wastefulness presents an opportunity to tackle the economic status quo that caused the climate crisis in the first place. As we confront the climate crisis, we must also shape, sorry, reshape our economy to create a more democratic, equal and sustainable society. This must be the guiding principle at the heart of any energy strategy. Uh, an energy strategy should, as others have said, be rural-proofed rural and must take account of the specific issues facing rural areas that result in more carbon-intensive lifestyles, such as sparse connections to the gas grid, poor investment in rural renewable infrastructure and extremely limited public transport. We must grow the economy uh, through a Green New Deal. By 2016, more than 50 renewable companies were active here in the north. And as of March 2020, this figure now stands at just five. Less than 1 per cent of the private sector workforce is employed in the green economy, which is accountable for 1.6 of total turnover. 
Given the vast economic potential of our renewable resources and the opportunities for high-skilled jobs, high-value research and innovation, retrofit, retrofitting, construction and green infrastructure that stem from these, this is a stark policy failure. Prioritising the green economy should guide energy strategy policy. An 80 per cent target for renewable electricity by 2030 could result in 1.1 billion of new investment in the north. Climate change does not recognise borders, and to be effective, the island of Ireland must operate together wherever possible to ensure maximum efficiency gains remarks, and most appropriate uses of resources. In conclusion, Ken Collier, uh, I welcome this strategy and shift in policy it represents. Thank you. Uh, call Gary Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, like others, I welcome the motion here as an economy committee member. I want to uh, thank all of the members who uh, played their role in bringing this forward, but also to the clerk and to the assembly staff for uh, the way that they uh, conducted themselves in relation to this matter, but also in, in all of the matters, because as members have already said, energy is a huge part to play in what is a very significant and large. Um, economy department, so, so I do thank them for that. Uh, in terms of the micro inquiry itself, there was a large range of uh, responses from right across energy and business organisations, consumers, individuals and acad academics, and I think there was a lot of good engagement there, um, and it has brought together this very uh, important report. But of course, this report is just the beginning. It's the beginning of a, a conversation in terms of, and a discussion in terms of uh, the ideas that were brought forward. Uh, but we know that, uh, as that is provided to the Department for the Economy, the energy strategy itself will, of course, determine future priorities and potential changes needed to achieve uh, the targets within it. So, uh, whilst we want to see progress as soon as possible, we recognise that there are time frames to be met, and we hope that uh, the consultation for the energy strategy can be brought out uh, early uh, in 2021. Uh, but of course, there's no time to stand still, and we need to continue to make progress. And I do welcome the fact that the minister has set uh, this as one of her priorities, and she has, of course announced that the, the uh, 2030 renewable electricity target has been at least 70 per cent. I know myself, like other members, will have met many people across the various sectors who have welcomed that. And, and Of course, there will be those who, who will say that we need to be more ambitious, but I think it is welcome uh, that we have that uh, target set in place. In terms of what would be or what should be the key elements of the energy strategy, we've got a range of views uh, that were brought forward. It is clear that there's strong support for the principal focus uh, from the energy strategy uh, that it should be the 2050 net zero carbon emissions target which the UK has adopted. So all of the actions contained within the strategy should promote at the very least and should be very consistent with the aim of meeting the 2050 target. Of course, it was highlighted that this should require cross-departmental working, and I think we all acknowledge and, and, and reflect upon the fact that all that we do within this assembly requires a certain le level of that. As has been highlighted by other members in the chamber as well, uh, consumers and affordability is a key issue, and I do welcome uh, the fact that uh, the response has very much brought that to the fore, because all of us who represent constitu constituents out there, uh, we want to ensure that uh, whatever comes out, that, that, it, that it tackles fuel poverty, that, that there's a benefit uh, to the consumer and there's a benefit uh, to, to businesses as well. In terms of the infrastructure element, again, it's very, very important. There was a strong recognition that we need to see more investment in uh, public transport systems as a way to reduce energy. Um, uh, also, uh, there, was, there was an important view, uh, which I also share, around the, the fact that we need to see more investment in the electricity grid and the realisation of strategic infrastructure in a timely manner, which is indeed crucial as well. Uh, on a final note, I just want to say in terms of promoting the energy strategy and increasing public awareness, that was a, an important point which came out of the micro inquiry as well. People, we want to encourage um, stakeholders to be fully aware of the energy strategy and the draft energy strategy and how their role as both businesses and consumers is important to its success. But finally, it is important as well that we want to see involvement of communities at every level 
within our constituencies and within Northern Ireland because this is something that will impact us all and all of us have a role to play as well. So I look forward to seeing the outcome uh, of, of, the, um, of the debate around the energy strategy. We look forward to seeing the consultation. Of course, there will be many more discussions to be had in this chamber around all of the details, but I think it is an important discussion we're having today uh, and, as I say, I very much welcome this motion. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you, Nicole. John O'Dowd. Uh, and apologies to the Chair and, and the other members who have spoken on this and, uh, report thus far for not being in the Chamber for, for most of it. Uh, but it is an important piece of work. Um, the, the, committee, uh, the committee clerk and staff all have to be congratulated on, on the work that has been brought forward into what is proving a more important issue each time we debate it almost uh, in this Chamber. And of course, we have to move beyond debate to action and seeing change in how we. Uh, produce our energy, how we manage our energy, and how we invest in that, and in turn ensure that that investment is for the benefit uh, of all the people we serve. With the ongoing economic crisis uh, caused by COVID-19, not only here across this island, and indeed these islands and, and globally, uh, eyes are now turning as to how we come out the other side of that economic uh, disaster. Uh, and over the weekend, and indeed perhaps over a longer period of time, we've heard talk of higher taxes. I don't object to higher taxes, but I want to know who they're going to tax higher, uh, because experience tells us it's not always those who can afford to pay the most. Uh, we hear talk of public sector pay freezes. Uh, we hear talk of cuts to public sector spending, which are all of great concern, particularly to those uh, in lower income brackets. And when they hear politicians and assemblies talking about climate action, climate change, new energy strategies, they're quietly concerned and they'll turn to them and say, well, who's going to pay for that? If, is new energy going to cost me as a consumer uh, trying to run my family home or my small business or, or, or even large business? Is it going to cost me more? Am I going to uh, do without and other things for my family as a result? And it doesn't have to be the case of that. In fact, green energy and Tackling climate change can be an economic driver if used properly. If we can invest in schemes and programmes that create green energy, create jobs and create sustainability, then why wouldn't we do it? And that's the factor and the prism through all of this has to be looked at and examined. Because it, it, it is, note, and a number of speakers have heard saying, the consumer is concerned. But let's allay that concern by saying we see this as an economic driver and a way forward for change to create. We, we as a society, could be energy providers across these islands if we invest properly. We could lead the way in terms of how we retrofit our homes. Uh, the, the Minister for Communities has recently announced uh, a programme of new social house building. They can and should be built to the highest standards in terms of energy efficiency. And I know the housing executive or the social housing building programme, the housing executive currently doesn't build. But those who are involved in social housing building are fitting their properties out to very, very high standards, which means then there's less cost in heating them. But there can be improvements made there. And, and uh, can I call you? I, I can't speak on energy without plugging my own bill I propose to bring forward in the near future, it is out to public consultation. And that looks at how we allow for micro-generation of green energy, where we allow uh, farmers, where we allow uh, individuals and communities to produce energy and then sell that energy back to the major producers and call on the producers to have a fixed price for that and ensure that they purchase at least 5% of their energy from those producers. That allows for the production of energy to be brought down into communities. Last week we had a debate, and I think the debate enough as well in Townsend, in terms of uh, how agriculture produces harmful greenhouse gases, or how certain elements of agriculture produce greenhouse gases. So rather than simply, it's an important area to focus on, but rather than simply focusing on how agriculture produces harmful gases, we should be looking at how we support agriculture to produce energy. 
If we can get our farming community, and many, of them, many are, uh, and others involved in the production of energy, then they don't see this as an attack on them. They see this as an opportunity. And indeed, many uh, small businesses and, and individuals could also be producing energy. So we'll hear more, hopefully, of the bill in the time to come during the consultation. But I welcome the report. I think it's another example of how committees in this place do important work. Not always, they don't always attract the headlines, but they do important work behind the scenes. And a lot of work is done on our committee. So I congratulate everyone involved in formulating the committee. So thank you. Thank you. And I call Roy Beggs. Mr. Speaker, I find this to be a useful report, although I have to say it tended to be a, a gathering of information rather than very clear uh, recommendations. I would have preferred to have seen more, more clear recommendations. Um, mention is made in the motion that, that there's a wish for ambitious targets. Uh, from reading the report, I, I didn't get that within the report. Uh, I'll, I'll illustrate what I'm talking about. When you uh, looked at what is mentioned in terms of the different options that are available, um, we were reported that some want 70% renewable energy by 2030, some 80% by 2030, some 100% by 2035, some zero, uh, a net zero by uh, 2040, um, and others want 100% renewable as soon as possible. I don't, I don't know what actually the committee is recommending. It was just reporting a whole series of figures. So it is. It would be better if uh, the policy can be further developed with, with clear, clearer targets going forward. Uh, and I do recognise that this is a cross-cutting issue, so it's, it's more than just uh, the economy committee. Uh, uh, as I certainly believe, reducing our hydrocarbons is... Uh, there are two, two sides to it. Is yes, replacing hydrocarbons with renewable energy, but it should also be about reducing the energy demand in the first place. Uh, and I would, again, I would like to have seen greater reference to uh, the Green New Deal scheme. Interestingly, I, I just visited a, a new um, development on Friday, uh, destined for social housing. Triple glazing, not double glazing, triple glazing. Heat ventilation recovery system. Now, all built to a very high standard. I suspect the energy loads for those new tenants will be very, very low. So uh, by designing our houses from the start, we can actually considerably reduce our energy demands. Uh, and mention has been made by others about retrofitting. We do need to look at what our building control standards are for our new buildings. Do we need to further increase them? Because uh, if you build them from the beginning, that's the most efficient way, rather than in five or ten years' time having to go back and add further uh, insulation. So I, I would urge that we would look at our new build to see whether we need to increase that uh, efficiency right from the start. Uh, it is difficult in some houses to retrofit and certainly can, can be expensive, but we also need to look at retrofitting uh, insulation to bring about improvements. And like others, I do welcome... Uh, the change in the, in the housing executive. This may uh, enable further houses to be built in a much more efficient and higher, higher standard uh, for the benefit of the tenants. Now, we do have to recognise uh, in these new houses there may be a slightly higher rent because it's built to a higher standard. But look at the total cost. What is the energy bill going to be uh, and the quality of the environment in which individuals are living uh, where there should not be any more damp. That should be a thing of the past. Uh, uh, thermostats to regulate heat, so it actually reduced uh, bills even further. So it is possible to, to improve standards going forward in, in that uh, heating side of things. Uh, also, a mention has been made uh, about new bespoke, bespoke schemes going forward. I am conscious that Northern Ireland is one and the only part of the United Kingdom and, and there's a, also within the Republic of Ireland where uh, presently there are not the same levels of support from government to, uh, to market for new uh, energy schemes. Now, I suspect that's been a sad re reflection of our past in terms of RHI, even in terms of uh, other forms of renewable energy where the Northern Ireland Audit Office recently reported that some turbines were owners were being paid perhaps up to £100,000 a year above which actually they need it. So it's very important going forward that we learn lessons and that we deviate from schemes that are applicable elsewhere with great caution. 
and we make sure we build in contingency plans uh, so that uh, any rates that are set can be quickly adapted uh, right from the start in that premier leg legislation should there, should there need to be so. Transport is another important area, uh, and on that I would uh, say yes, uh, electric uh, cars are increasing, and, and the Prime Minister has just indicated that. But equally so, as others have said, we need to get into uh, hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen hub needs to be created for Northern Ireland to support our, our buses, HGVs, heavier goods vehicles, vehicles travelling longer. Hydrogen would seem to be the only way. Already many other countries are taking a step ahead of us. China in particular is investing heavily in this. I would urge that Northern Ireland would catch up and create its own energy hub for hydrogen. Thank you. And I call uh, Claire Bailey. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Green Party also very much welcome this motion before the House today, um, and we're greatly encouraged by the vast range of views and positive suggestions given by people and organisations to the Energy Strategy Micro Inquiry. Um, we would like to see them now carefully an anal analysed to extract the enormous amount of value and level of expertise given to us in the report. And while we're hearing very strong common themes of interconnectivity coming from the speakers on the floor, we feel that there is that gap in the responses because most of the responses are about energy. And of course, as we're hearing now during the debate, that that's only half of what we should be thinking about. Rather than singularly focused on energy, the focus rightly needs to extend to the green economy and how all of these things are suggested in the micro inquiry can be used to generate more jobs better jobs, more savings, and better, healthier lifestyles, while also giving us the tools to combat and begin to redress the damage that we have allowed to be done to our environment before we reach the point of no return. And we know that this House has recognised through previous motions and debates that we are in a climate crisis and that decarbonising is absolutely urgent and essential. If the primary role of government is to work for the betterment of its people, so one of the primary purposes of an energy strategy should be to provide a healthy, robust and sustainable economy in which all people can thrive. So the Green Party sees this future through a Climate Change Act transforming and growing Northern Ireland from a fossil fuel driven economy to a green energy economy. And with the level of renewable electricity being produced and managed, that Northern Ireland will become a world leader in the technologies of renewable electricity and smart grid. The green economy provides for a range of really transformative policies that will help us rebuild this society in a sustainable and ethical way, including, but of course not limited to, decarbonising our energy systems to prevent the worst of climate change and the immense monetary costs that that global warming would bring to the people of Northern Ireland. Opening a new range of quality jobs and economic opportunities for the people in Northern Ireland providing a solid base for our economy to grow and compete on the European and world stage, preserving the biodiversity on which our planet and ourselves depend on for our existence, and providing Northern Ireland, providing a Northern Ireland sorry, that will sustain and nourish our children and their children, both physically and economically. But we really need to focus on the priorities here. The proposed energy strategy process of which this micro inquiry report and debate are part of will take another year to be enacted. And only then will the required actions begin to be planned and deployed, which is likely to take another two years post November 2021. Mr. Speaker, we simply cannot wait another three years, particularly when the existing strategy is 11 years old. The Economy Minister herself acknowledged this in her presentation at the Energy Forum on the 29th of September and in her subsequent written answers to me that she would not wait on the energy strategy to take urgent action. So I'd like to ask the Minister to clarify what exactly these actions are and when will she be carrying them out. While the Green Party are not in the executive, nor are we members of the Economy Committee, I am confident that as a party we can offer some very valuable advice when it comes to the priorities and actions that should be taken. So I am delighted to have the opportunity through this motion to put some of them on record. In my party's views, these actions should be based around four key themes. Electric vehicle charging infrastructure, 
It's obvious in Northern Ireland that we're being left behind, behind GB and ROI, in terms of uptake of electric cars. The main issue, of course, being the absence of adequate charging infrastructure. Would Certainly would. Would the member accept that uh, the reluctance to buy electric cars may be more so of the initial uh, funding that's required to buy them, uh, but there's emerging evidence that their actual running costs over a number of years can be actually slightly cheaper. Uh, but with uh, 300 yard miles perhaps radius, that's more than adequate for most people in their daily commute. I would accept those points, but certainly my conversations with electric vehicle owners who have given them up is because of bad infrastructure, so that is, it is an issue that needs to be tackled. Um, the existing charging network is outdated, it's not reliable, and it needs to be urgently upgraded and extended. We are suggesting that the Minister for Economy and the Minister for Infrastructure work together with the owners and operators of this existing network to find a way to get more investment and unlock the potential of vehicles, electric vehicles for Northern Ireland, because if we don't build it, they will not come. The other key area would be building regulations, and it's been mentioned. We know that we are still building homes today that are not adequately insulated and are using fossil fuel boilers for heating. And we heard a little about this also earlier today during the ministerial question times. So we suggest that we need to move quickly to change the building regulations so that we design and build for the future zero carbon world. We are urging the Minister for Finance to produce the technical documentations immediately on the requirements for new buildings to be erected to be nearly zero energy buildings. We need this as soon as is physical po physically possible so that they work seamlessly with the Minister of Community's announcement regarding the Housing Executive and the proposals to build more homes where they're needed. Let's not be content with another issue that we know, know needs addressed and fails to be delivered on time. We are already behind ourselves. Until these measures are made and mandated, all we will continue to do is stack up more problems for the future. And the other Key area, as has been mentioned, is the grid investment. Member's time is up. The other one is also connecting to the grid and the costs that Mr. Aiken has raised. So we would really support this motion and thank the committee very much for bringing it to the House. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the uh, Economy Minister, Ms. Diane Dawes. And the Minister will have 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And apologies for my coughing fit earlier. It's a dry throat and possibly, may I say, for a politician, too much talking, um, um, rather than anything more sinister. Um, I welcome the opportunity to respond to this motion, and I congratulate the Economy Committee on producing this report. It's an exceptionally important issue. I would also like to thank the individuals, academics, organisations and businesses that helped to provide the broad scope of views contained within it. My department has engaged with many hundreds of stakeholders in the development of the energy strategy to date, and it is encouraging to see the consistency in the themes being raised in this report. I am struck by the positivity and ambition that comes through from our stakeholders, and I would like to use today to discuss how the energy strategy can help to take advantage of the opportunities that are open to us. Many in this chamber have spoken of the importance of the energy strategy. I agree. Developing a new energy strategy is one of my top priorities. This strategy will set out the vision for our energy system to 2050, and there is a major programme of work ongoing to deliver this. It is important to highlight that our strategy will be a living, breathing document once published, it will be regularly monitored, reviewed and updated to ensure it is future-proof and able to respond to developments. Our future success will be built on many people working together and a collaborative approach has been uh, taken to developing the strategy. My department carried out a call for evidence which received over 160 responses from a wide range of organisations and individuals. There were also a number of stakeholder events across Northern Ireland. Five working groups covering more than 70 individuals from over 30 organisations have been established and are working on developing policy options. This is being supplemented by additional research and inputs from academics and international experts. 
My department is therefore drawing on an extensive network from across government, the energy sector and a wide range of stakeholders in developing the strategy. The report presented today by the committee will be considered alongside this evidence gathered to date. This will contribute towards the policy options and future scenarios being developed which will form the basis for the public consultation in March 2021. The report correctly highlights the need for a joined up approach across government. I completely support this view and I'm delighted that the energy strategy is now providing this leadership. The energy strategy government stakeholders group brings together central government, local government and the utility regulator to ensure the policies and programmes being taken forward at this time across government are aligned and joined up. There is also significant membership across the five working groups from both central and local government alongside industry and stakeholders to ensure that the development of policy involves all those who have a role in delivering it from the outset. I welcome the fact that the Department for Infrastructure is leading on the transport theme within the energy strategy, which demonstrates the cross-departmental approach being taken. I want this to be a true executive-wide energy strategy, and this is reflected in our approach. I agree with and recognise the need for clear and ambitious targets. We continue to work within the context of net zero emissions by 2050, and this will guide the focus of the strategy. I'm also working closely with the Environment Minister to ensure that any future targets on emissions reductions will be reflected in the energy strategy. The committee chair referred to the need for measurable targets, and this is a key part of the ongoing work. I have already made a strong statement on my ambition that the strategy will contain a target of at least 70% of our electricity consumption to come from renewable sources by 2030. One of those immediate actions that the Green Party leader uh, referred to uh, in her contribution. This provides a clear signal to the industry and wider stakeholders to allow them to begin to plan investment now in advance of the strategy being published. However, if we are going to meet ambitious targets that will be in an energy strategy, the executive will need to reflect this as one of its top priorities. I expect to see a prominent role for the energy strategy in addressing climate change and growing a green economy in a new programme for government. We will also need to ensure that the ambition within a new energy strategy is backed up by funding to reflect its importance for society, the economy and consumers. There are many steps we will need to take to decarbonise energy, but our first priority has to be energy efficiency. I welcome that this has been identified as a priority in the report. Energy efficiency can play a vital role in driving down emissions, helping to tackle fuel poverty and providing positive health outcomes. Energy efficiency and retrofitting are also widely being recognised as an important policy lever for green economic recovery, with significant potential for job creation going forward. It reassures me to see that much of the report's findings align closely with the work currently being taken forward to develop policy options in this area. We will, of course, need to look at ways to decarbonise heat, power and transport our success at achieving and exceeding 40% renewable electricity targets demonstrates what we can achieve with a clear target and supporting policies. Our renewables base is a fantastic asset to have, particularly as the electrification of heat and transport will feature in our future energy mix. I see a clean indigenous renewables base being key to our future energy mix. And every kilowatt hour of energy we generate from indigenous renewables is a kilowatt hour we are not importing fossil fuels. But I am also clear that there is no single solution and we will need to deploy a range of technologies and approaches and make, most, uh, make the use of our other assets such as our agriculture base 
and modern gas infrastructure. The options consultation in March 2021 will outline both short-term low regret options as well as the long-term potential scenarios that we can achieve our aims. I want to specifically highlight that the role of consumers is crucial in this energy transition. Consumers are at the heart of the strategy and will be involved in its development and implementation. We need to both enable those consumers who want to be active in generating and trading energy, while also protecting others, particularly the most vulnerable. We need to rethink our relationship with consumers and make this a two-way engagement with the energy sector that brings our citizens on the journey with us. The provision of a one-stop shop to provide information, advice and support to consumers came through strongly in our call for evidence. And my officials are looking into options for a single delivery body as part of the strategy development. Costs are, of course, key for consumers. And I believe that a long-term energy system based around clean, indigenous renewables that makes use of our abundant natural resources can be cheaper than today. But there will be investments with associated costs along the way. This is why an evidence-based approach is being taken to the energy strategy development to identify the most cost-effective options for domestic and business consumers. I also want to use the energy strategy to grow a green economy. When I published the medium-term plan for rebuilding a stronger economy in June 2020, and it has been referred to in the chamber today, I identified clean energy as a priority for future investment. We currently have a low carbon and renewable energy economy made up of 3,500 businesses, around 5,400 jobs, and 270 million of exports. But this could be so much larger. And in the context of our response to COVID, there is a real economic recovery opportunity in decarbonizing energy as part of the growing green economy across Northern Ireland. I see these opportunities leading the way in green hydrogen production, our world-class manufacturing base contributing to supply chains, for example, in offshore wind, hydrogen buses and electrolyzers, innovative pilot projects and new energy technologies that can be scaled up and deployed across the world, significant capital investments in buildings and new infrastructure needed to generate and distribute low carbon energy, opportunities for energy entrepreneurs and business startups developing skills in green energy technologies, low carbon buildings and transport. I'm excited by the developments in the hydrogen economy to date. There are a range of potential projects that can showcase our ability to develop cutting edge hydrogen technology here in Northern Ireland. This was particularly mentioned um, by Kelly Armstrong and Paul Frew, and I'm delighted to have been able to provide funding to Northern Ireland Water to trial an innovative new commercial sized electrolyzer as part of their wastewater treatment works. Uh, would the minister give way? Yes, I would. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the minister's remark. She will be aware of anybody who's actually visited a waste treatment plant, particularly with Northern Ireland Water. Many of them were built and provided with anaerobic digesters, which, of course, due to the contracting arrangements in Northern Ireland Water, they've never been able to use and never been able to use them for renewable energy. I am, of course, aware that there are a number um, of uh, problems that are associated um, with uh, the energy sector. However, what I want us to focus on is the potential going forward. This is an exciting new development in the field uh, of hydrogen energy. And if we can make this work, we'll not only save for Northern Ireland water, we will be um, at, at the cutting edge um, of how we take uh, this particular sector forward. This um, particular uh, um, trial could be part of a portfolio of projects that could lead to a real stimulus, stimulus to growing a local, and world-leading hydrogen economy. There's also been reference in the chamber today to the work at Wright Bus and the need for that hydrogen hub uh, at Balamina. I have um, met um, on a number of occasions 
uh, with uh, our colleagues there and uh, assure you that this is something that we are exploring um, and I am also exploring the potential for further funding uh, from uh, central government in relation to this issue. Of course I would. Thank you, Minister. I thank the Minister for the interest that she has shown on this particular issue. And obviously, as right uh, bosses in, in our constituents in North Andrum, but can she uh, assure us that she is aware of the concerns? If you listen to uh, Butta, who is the, the general manager, and Joe, who both presented to the Infrastructure Committee just a couple of weeks ago, and their frustration about progress, because they are businessmen, they, they work in a business environment, they don't work, thankfully, uh, uh, to the pace of this building or any other bureaucracy, and would you assure us that there is a degree of haste in terms of trying to bring some of these schemes forward? I would, of course, like to see these schemes come forward um, at pace. Um, I received um, the um, latest submission from uh, Rightbus just last week, um, and I have asked Invest Northern Ireland to look at it with them. Um, I think that these are really exciting opportunities for Northern Ireland. We've also done some work uh, with the local council to see if we can have a hydrogen academy um, in, uh, on the, the site. And we believe that um, this will grow the skills base for Northern Ireland to become a leading edge contributor in this sector of the economy. To conclude, I welcome the report by the Economy Committee and the opportunity afforded to me to respond to today's motion. I am excited by the opportunities that will come through a new energy strategy. This report is a welcome addition to the evidence that is already gathered. I am looking forward to March next year and the publication of the options and the consultation um, so that we will be able to take this forward and lay down a roadmap for Northern Ireland's energy needs into the future. Thank you. Thank you. And I call the Deputy Chairperson of the Committee, Sinead McLaughlin. And Sinead, you'll have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm delighted to rise on behalf of the Economic Committee to wind up today's extremely important debate. As the Committee Chair and other members of the Committee have indicated, we are very keen to engage with the Minister to ensure that members and stakeholders' views on the shape of the new uh, energy strategy are acted upon. I'd like to thank the Minister and all those members who contributed for their participation today, and I'd also like to thank the many stakeholders who have contributed their views to the Committee's special report, as well as the Committee team for their work behind the scenes. The forthcoming energy strategy is a key part of our interlocking network of policies that will help us to bring our economy into recovery and to build it back better than it was. This energy strategy will take its decades into the future and will be a key determinant of how we respond to the climate emergency, as well as creating thousands of new jobs in related sectors. I now speak on behalf of the SDLP as the party's economy and energy person. Today, my party has launched its energy policy. It is radical, exciting and forward-looking. Northern Ireland can be a world leader in the restructuring of the energy market to eliminate carbon emissions. We have the right weather conditions and ge geography to take advantage of the necessity to reform the energy market through wind, geothermal and tidal plus a role for solo, solar and hydro. We can be not only self-sufficient in electricity production, but use the surplus energy to become global leaders in essential new technologies of battery storage and green hydrogen. Northern Ireland has academic researchers and businesses engaged in developing these technologies, promising jobs and wealth for our society. Although we are still blighted, by the COVID-19 crisis, it is essential that we already consider our economic and social recovery. Investing in green infrastructure provides the basis for future economic growth and also jobs in the near term. That is why we want to fast track investment in electricity and broadband. We also have to move and move very quickly. Northern Ireland and particularly my city of Derry has a serious problem with air pollution which is literally killing hundreds of people prematurely each year. 
Air pollution is recognised as a major factor in COVID-19 mortality. So, as well as moving ahead with electric cars and hydrogen-powered buses and trucks, we must act against the burning of coal and wood, promoting instead clean, clean energy sources. These can also combat fuel poverty, given that coal is an inefficient and expensive means of home heating. We must make progress with the Green New Deal to bring our housing stock up to the highest of standards of energy efficiency and decentralised renewable energy generation. These policies would create substantial numbers of new jobs as well as cut our carbon emissions. Mr Speaker, this motion today is timely and I am delighted at the level of debate and contributions being made by members right across this House. There were high levels of synergy around the key areas of the debate, and I will now uh, reflect the members' contributions. First off, we heard from um, Gordon Dunn, and he stressed, rightly so, about the energy affordability and security of supply. Um, where th those were his key uh, themes. Gordon also highlighted some of the challenges in relating to weak infrastructure. He talked about the gas networks and how they needed to be expanded and the need for a mix of energy sources. Uh, Gordon also highlighted the opportunities of hydrogen energy and uh, ensuring that there was a fit for purpose energy, energy strategy for Northern Ireland. Pat Catney welcomed the cross party support for bringing together an ambitious energy strategy. The growth of renewables in Northern Ireland was to be applauded and that success augmented well for our future. Future targets must be followed by good incentive schemes to support the consumer engaging, engagement. Again, Pat uh, indicated that a lot was relying on behavioural changes uh, within the communities, and, and that shift was important. Steve Aiken, uh, in his uh, address, uh, talked about his previous role within the British and Irish Chamber of Commerce, in which he outlined the barriers um, for Northern Ireland in, re in relation to energy. He talked about monopolies, he talked about the role of the regulator uh, and the Department of Economy, whether it was fit for purpose based on previous renewable schemes and the lack of ambition. And he outlined that we really need to stretch ourselves uh, and, uh, in relation to the, the ambitions. Uh, and, and we could be more ambitious than we have currently stated to date. So we should be, he, he emphasised that we should be recognised as leaders in the energy sector, and he talked uh, in depth about the biogas and the surplus that we have, but he said that we do have particular challenges and talked about planning, uh, and I would agree with him in that aspect as well. We need to be more ambitious, and he talked about we should look towards 2035 as realising some of the ambitions um, that, that, that could be achievable. Kelly Armstrong uh, welcomed the report again, um, and she called for a very much evidence-based uh, approach. She said we could and should become world leaders, and that was a common theme that uh, a lot of members contributed to, uh, and she endorsed the points that were made by Mr Aiken. She warned against uh, departmental silos, and that also was a theme that many members raised. She talked about Green New Deal must also be very much interconnected and the need to develop a skill base, which I know um, the minister herself is very much uh, supporting and champion uh, for us to deliver for our economy going forward. She talked about uh, the housing stock and the very important part that it played and to look at that there was adequate investment for the heat and light of homes, particularly in the rental sector. And that's something that our, our, our social housing stock is very, very good, but our rental sector uh, can have very, very poor uh, use of energy and, and very high cost as well. Uh, Kelly also talked about transport uh, and the very, very high private car dependency that we have here in Northern Ireland and how we need to transition to public transport. Uh, and, and we had fallen a little bit back in that because of, of COVID-19. Paul Frew um, welcomed the report. Um, he said the big issue that faces us uh, is the, the, the heavy cost and the high cost, particularly for industrial uh, users. And this is something that uh, is close to my heart as well. Um, we are not very 
competitive when it comes to, to costs for our manufacturing sector uh, in relation to energy. So any new energy strategy must uh, address that. Um, he spoke from about his own constituency and talked about right bus um, uh, and, and uh, the, the, the development of hydrogen as well. Uh, and close to, to Mr Free's heart, uh, as always, he talked in depth about the systems operator and, and said that transparency uh, was required in uh, the context of the relationship between uh, Sony and Airgrid. Um, and he said that no matter what we do, if we don't get that right, um, there will be poor outcomes. He said that we need to... Um, we need to be sure that the system operator uh, functions properly and it is fit for purpose. I hope he's happy that I've reflected exactly what he said. So Philip McGuigan then, he discussed the energy strategy um, in a global context. He, he, he spoke about the need for a radical uh, climate action. And he also pointed out that Northern Ireland uh, did not have a, a climate act like the other three nations within within the context of the United Kingdom, uh, and it was something that we needed to act upon very very quickly. And again, he spoke uh, in depth about a just transition was the key uh, it was the key uh, theme of his address, and outlined the health benefits of decarbonisation. And also, um, he he was very much aware of rural proofing, um, any kind of energy strategy that was coming along and uh, making sure that uh, there was an all-island approach to, to energy within, within this small island. Gary Middleton, he welcomed the wide uh, engagement in bringing together a report, and he said it was an important discuss, discuss, discussion sorry, and, and talked about no time to stand still. Um, he, he also emphasised the need for cross-departmental working, again, no silos uh, working together. Fuel poverty also highlighted, was highlighted in his, uh, his address as well, and the benefit to consumers uh, was very important, both business and domestic consumers. Members more, time, nearly up. Right, more investment was required in the electricity uh, grid. John O'Doy, the importance of energy uh, is actually growing each time the issue is discussed. He discussed the top, uh, cost of energy transition and tackling crime Members change time is up. should be an enorm enormous economic drive. Okay. And sorry to the others that I haven't reflected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, and the question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't really know. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Members, please take a raise for a moment or two. Thank you.